Um, so, I'm Hilary Graves. I'm a moral philosopher at the University of Oxford. Um, I work in various issues spread fairly widely across ethics, but one of my focuses at the moment is population ethics. That is to say, what ethical theory has to say about what you should do when your decision might affect either the number or the identities of people who will live in the future. Um, so I have a, a research and teaching role. I currently also direct a project on population ethics that's funded by the Liebigen Trust, one of the major grant-giving organizations in the UK. Population ethics encourages us to consider some of the larger scale and longer term implications of our actions. Uh, perhaps more than we would if we were just thinking about regular non-population ethics. So in, in the normal context, you're dealing with situations where you assume that it's fixed independently of your decision how many people there are going to be, and you're really just talking about distributive concerns. So you're asking questions like, is it worth me sacrificing a little bit of my material consumption in order to, say, reduce disease prevalence in developing countries? Um, but all of those, for, for all of our actions, there are also longer term knock-on effects of what we do. So for example, if I donate to the Against Malaria Foundation now and that results in the lives of a few children being saved, those children themselves will grow up and have children. So we need to face up to the fact that there are potentially, there's potentially a cascade of long term effects of what I did. Um, and in principle, of course, when we're evaluating our actions, we want to count all the effects of our actions, not just the ones that are most salient and obvious to us. So in principle, if we think that these effects might be significant in size compared to the immediate ones. We need to know how to evaluate them. And those are questions where different theories that are taken seriously by some people working in theoretical moral philosophy will have different verdicts on, on the value of those longer term effects. If we assume that David Pierce, for instance, is right and um, the future of humanity could have extremely high levels of set points and would, ex would flourish in ways that we don't quite comprehend, yes, and, um, and if there could be so many more people in the future just distributed out through the universe, right, mm -hmm. then um, that seems like a pretty, pretty big concern, like if we, if we, you know, if we have an extinction event, then that won't happen. To what extent are you um, concerned about these things, or you think we should be concerned about extinction? So I'm very concerned about it, and um, this is partly because of the way in which I personally think the, the questions in population ethics should be answered. So maybe it helps to make things a little bit more concrete by sketching a couple of the rival theories. Um, some people think the thing that we should be trying to maximize is the average well-being level of the people who ever live. Um, that would entail that if future people, so if, if the view that you just sketched was wrong, if future people would actually have a well-being level that's pretty much the same as the average of present and past people, then that view would not care about extinction. You could have these extra people, or you could not have these extra people, the average will be the same either way. If, on the other hand, you think that the thing you're trying to maximize is the total well-being of all the people who ever live, then you have a far stronger presumption in favor of continuing humanity, because then you take very seriously the perspective you've just sketched, where you think, my goodness, there are, there's an awful lot of future lives at stake here. To not have those lives would be a massive loss to the total value of the universe. We should do more or less everything we can to, to prevent that or to reduce extinction risk. Yeah, yeah. And, and even that the, 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 the quality of life um, in the future may be far more better than it is today. So it's like you're just adding extra lives of the quality they have today. They could be like, you know, one year could equal um, 100 quality years in the human life mm -hmm. in the future or, you know, vastly more. Um, and that's what I'm a bit concerned about. We may have the potential that we're, we're entering an age where we could end up living in a sort of quote-unquote utopia, um, but we, we may also in the process uh, curtail our ability to achieve that through the very same means that we may achieve it. We seem to be developing all sorts of weird and wonderful technologies that enable certain futures, mm -hmm. but may have the upper edge, the double-edged sword may actually uh, cut right. back in the opposite direction. Right, so here you're in a, you're in a high-stakes situation where you need to weigh up the risks and rewards. If you're doing something that, if you're doing something that has the dual properties that if it works it will make future life much better, but it carries a risk of eliminating future life, so you know, a risky technology that will be very beneficial for future humanity if it works, but carries existential risks, then, then you've got some serious weighing up to do. But I mean, in general, if you take the perspective that we're trying to maximize total well-being, and if you think that the number of 
possible future humans, provided we don't cause humanity to go extinct is immense, then qualitatively speaking, when you do those calculations, you're going to tend to get the result that even if the probability of extinction generated by that kind of technology is, is astronomically tiny, the risk's not worth taking because there's so much at stake. What do you think are the most interesting questions being asked in the EA movement at the moment? Wow, um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to comment. Um, well, what are, you, what are your impressions anyway? So I think there are very interesting questions at the level of weighing up radically different kinds of causes against one another. So I think that the theory is relatively well understood. If you've already decided that you want to reduce, say, disease prevalence for global poverty-related reasons, then we have relatively well understood metrics coming out of health economics that tell you how to weigh up one intervention against another, even if the diseases being treated are very different and have very different kind of deleterious health effects. We, we understand very fairly well how to put different kind of health defects on a common scale. What we have much less understanding of is how to weigh up, say, improvements of health against reductions of existential risk or benefits to humans against benefits to animals. So I think a lot of the, the questions that are simultaneously conceptually quite thorny but at the same time incredibly important um, and maybe where, where it seems to me most of the interesting research action is going to be over the next few years. Totally agree. It seems as though there are certain um, risks that are very predictable, like we can predict an asteroid if it's going to, if its trajectory is going to hit the Earth, we can know that that's an existential risk mm -hmm. to a higher degree than we know that AI is going to, uh, you know, do, do bad things for mm -hmm. the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, have you? What what is it about like um, uncertainty? Do we need to be certain about outcomes in order to justify working on trying to uh, mitigate the negative effects, mm -hmm. the negative possible uh, effects? Yeah, no, I would say absolutely not. Um, there are two levels of uncertainty we might be worrying about. So I mean, one one background comment is. Um, whenever somebody says they think the, the way you should evaluate actions is by looking at their consequences, somebody always pipes up with this point that, look, you never know exactly what the consequences of your actions are going to be. That, that one's an old point, and there's a well-known response, which is, yeah, sure, we don't know how to generate the best actual outcome, but we do have this thing we call decision theory, expected utility theory, which is precisely designed to deal with decision-making under uncertainty. And provided you've got some probabilities, even subjective probabilities, provided you've got some credences which tell you how likely you think this outcome is as opposed to this other outcome, then we know how to take the probability weighted average of the value of the outcome of our action and choose the action with the highest expected value, as we say. Um, I think that the somewhat harder question is, well, what do you do if you just don't know what your credences should be in that kind of situation? So you might have a situation where you've got a panel of experts or alleged experts, um, and they all have somewhat different credences as to you know, how likely this particular existential risk is. And it might be the case that if you adopt the credences of expert A, then you'll think this research problem is very important. If you adopt the credences of expert B, you'll think this other one is very important. That's a much thornier situation because there doesn't seem to be any obvious way of picking which one is the right credence function to have. Um, but I mean, what do we do? We know that doing nothing is not the best option. So. We just have to you know, try to find problems where, for a wide variety of reasonable ways of assigning your credences, you'll reach similar conclusions about what we should do or some such. Yeah, thing. yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question, um, how to deal with disagreement. If there's, you know, if you have peer disagreement on, on issues that seem quite important, how do you, what's your intuitions on the best way to go about, um, you know, resolving mm -hmm. these differences or choosing which, you know, which are, which credences have the, the, the most weight or the most yeah. utility? Sure. Um, I mean, I have nothing very original to say about this. I suppose the two things I would try to do is, firstly, not all credences are created equal. So some people are obviously more of an expert in their field than others, and we have independent ways of assessing that. So you can, you can assign a given person's credences more or less weight, depending on how eminent they are, how long they've thought about it, how many top publications they have in this field, and so on. Um, that's not going to eliminate all disagreement, of course. You're still going to have top people who disagree with one another. At that point, it seems to me you can't do much more than take some kind of average of their credences. So try to find, first find your group of experts, and then try to find something like the midpoint within that group of experts. 
it's not a perfect method, but, but no method is perfect, so my guess is that's about the best we've got. What sort of questions do you think aren't being asked at the moment in the ineffective altruist movement, or, um, yeah, let's start there. I mean, I guess that's a... uh, well, EA is very good at asking questions, um, so I, I don't think there are any important questions that aren't being asked. There are an awful lot of questions that are being asked, um, but the, many of these are the ones I alluded to earlier, like how do we do these difficult trade-offs between very different kinds of benefits? How do we, um, how do we select a broad cause area to prioritize? Mm -hmm. What cause areas do you feel the, are the most underpopulated and, mo and the most underfunded? Probably existential risk. I mean, the concern with existential risk is growing, but that's a relatively new phenomenon. So the theory is, uh, relative to, to issues of global poverty and global health, which the international community has rightly devoted a lot of effort to over many decades, um, the concern with existential risk is, is a young field where the theory is still growing. So I think that's, a, you know, if, if you had a, a very bright young graduate student who wanted to move into a, an uncrowded area of research and wanted to know which, a, which EA area is likely to have the most low-hanging fruit. I would say probably that one, just because so many fewer people have already been thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It seems as though there's been quite a bit of interest of late. Um, I've noticed it really ramp up in the media and some, I guess, some figures that loom large in the imaginations of, like, the like much of the world, like the Bill Gateses and the Elon Musks and the Stephen Hawking's, the social call authorities and technologies and science and, and, and invention have suddenly started taking notice of these sorts of things. That's right. Why do you think that suddenly happened? Well, I mean, it didn't suddenly happen. Why, why now? Um, I mean, I guess just because people have been thinking seriously about things and starting to get the message out there, um, it's worked. People have started to notice. We need much more of that, but but we the, the, the cases you cite are evidence that we're going in the right direction on this. Definitely, okay. But is there any danger of um, these messages being sort of uh, portrayed in the wrong way or um, just, or, or talked about in, in the wrong way that scares people away or, or uh, maybe in, could induce a yuck factor or some sort of... Um, or that's, that sounds like science fiction, let's move on to another subject. Is there any way that, like, uh, the way that we disclose these ideas will affect how much effort is put into reducing X risk? Yeah, I, uh, definitely that's a genuine risk. I mean, as you say, it sounds very science fiction, and that is the reaction that a lot of people have when they first hear about it, especially if it, if it sounds like it's a kind of minority clique that's interested in this stuff, then it sounds like just another crazy thing that a bunch of guys dreamt up in the pub. Um, so yeah, I think that the focus needs to be on making the case that it's plausible that this is a sensible risk, rather than coming across as a bunch of computer science geeks who think about this stuff because really they think about it because it's fun to think about it because they like computer science and then they're trying to make the case that it's important. That's the, that's the impression we need to avoid giving at all costs. Mm, that's a good point. And it's, it's, it seems like a difficult problem. Have you uh, thought much about disclosure and how to actually address the general populace without sounding too geeky or sounding like you're just interested in thought experiments and not the real world? No, so I mean, I myself haven't been very closely involved in the, in the AI research, so that's, that's not something I've thought a great deal about. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so I currently direct a project that's called Population Ethics from Theory to Practice. Um, so, as the name suggests, that divides into two half. On, on the theoretical side, it's engaging with a growing literature in abstract theoretical moral philosophy that's attempting to answer this question I sketched earlier. How do you value states of affairs? How do you decide which is better or worse when the states of affairs you're dealing with involve different numbers of people? So that's the purely theoretical question where I'm trying to contribute to the debates there. But um, perhaps more saliently for the purposes of the effective altruism movement, um, is the theory to practice half of what I'm doing, where the situation I'm responding to is one where at the moment we have this disconnect between different intellectual communities who really ought to be talking to one another, but at the moment they're not because they're different people with somewhat different intellectual backgrounds. So the two groups I'm referring to are, on the one hand, the moral philosophers who theorize in terms of an abstract notion of quantities of well-being um, but don't always translate that into what it means for the real world in practice. Um, so there's that group on the one hand, and then at the other extreme you have people who are trying to do policy analysis, so maybe a cost-benefit analysis for this or that proposed intervention, 
And sometimes we're talking about interventions where it really should make a difference what you think about the abstract questions in, in theoretical moral philosophy regarding population ethics. But the people who are on the ground doing the policy analyses aren't the moral philosophers and they aren't talking to the moral philosophers and they're only hazily, if at all, aware that there are some really controversial, fundamental, evaluative questions sitting at the foundations here. So they don't really have the tools to say, OK, if you were to take this view in population ethics, then here's how your policy analysis would look, and this would be the conclusion. Whereas if you took this other view, then you'd come up with this different style of analysis. They, they sort of inevitably have to try and sweep the issues under the carpet and fudge them. But that's an undesirable state of affairs. So I want to build a, so a lot of my work at the moment is trying to build a bridge from theory to practice and develop the tools for cost-benefit analysis so that people know, okay, if what I was trying to maximize was the average, then here's how my real-world policy analysis was going. If what I was trying to maximize was the total, then here's what my framework would look like and here's what the conclusions would be. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, well, what's so, what's so exciting and special and amazing about now um, as to why people should get involved in effective altruism or if you want to answer it in a different way, why people should be interested in population ethics? Um, I guess I'll answer the first one. <laughs> um, the only, I mean, you suggested there's something special and amazing about now. I think that's true in the following respect. Many of us at an inchoate level, even if we were growing up in the 80s, say, would have had thoughts that with hindsight we can identify as effective altruist type thoughts. But at that time, it was very difficult to make them concrete. There was no movement that you could join. It was very difficult to find like-minded people. That's the stuff that's changing. So especially in the last two or three years, I mean, the very fact that we're, we're here having a conference called Effective Altruism Global illustrates the, the changes that are happening. Now, if you have those kind of thoughts, um, but you realize that there are big and difficult questions concerning what's the best way of putting them into practice, you know where to find the community of people who are also worried about the same thing. You have a body of existing analysis you can tap into and contribute. So, I mean, in, in my personal history, I had wanted for a long time to donate lots of money because I was perfectly aware that spending more money on myself was not really contributing to my well-being. I already had plenty. But at that point, I wasn't giving away money because I had this radical uncertainty about whether it would just be wasted. And then when I was able to find websites of organizations like GiveWell and Giving What We Can, and saw that people had really seriously thought things through, and I could read their spreadsheets and reproduce their analyses, and broadly agree with their conclusions, that's the point where you can have the confidence to say, yes, it's worth doing. It won't be money wasted. Yeah, excellent. That's a fantastic answer, actually. Is there any, any questions that you'd like to answer that I haven't actually asked or don't, don't know to ask? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I think that, so I mentioned earlier the, the relationship between moral philosophy and very broad cause selection as, as one area where I think there's, there's more and very interesting work to be done. Another sort of broad brush thing is there's a, a small but steadily increasing amount of dialogue going on between philosophy and economics regarding the methodology of policy evaluation. I think this is very valuable. So, you know, economics has a bunch of very well-developed tools, cost-effectiveness analysis, cost-benefit analysis, for trying to make quantitative and rigorous and precise how you should carry out evaluations that, that say, okay, of these two programs, which one is better? Um, those methodologies, however, inevitably take a controversial stand on some fairly fundamental ethical issues. What we're seeing steadily more of is moral philosophers who have the mathematical and analytical background required to understand what the economists are doing, coming in and engaging in dialogue with that. So there you have the two communities with complementary skills working together to improve the analytical tools. And I think that the more we see of that, the more confident we can be that when we do our analyses to, to guide our, our donation decisions or whatever our decisions are, um, that, that we're getting things right, we're making our decisions in sensible ways.